Uh, my name is Raka Ray, and I'm a professor of sociology here at Berkeley. Um, and I'm going to be moderating this event. What we decided is we're going to go back and forth with a sort of question and answer, and then um, Sandeep will do a book reading and, or read excerpts either during my conversation with him or after my conversation with him, and then we're going to throw it open um, to, to all of you. Um, I would like also to note that there is for the Sandeep followers in this room, um, there is going to be another a wonderful panel discussion uh, with Sandeep on the 17th of February at 5 o'clock here. And it's, uh, the topic is Activism, Journalism, Life, and Literature. And, and in addition to um, Sandeep, the panelists are uh, Lawrence Cohen, uh, Professor of Anthropology and Chair of the Center for South Asian Stu uh, the Institute of South Asian Studies, Harsha Ram, Professor of uh, Comparative Literature, and Paul Saha, Professor of English. So um, I urge you to come to what, what, what is sure to be a really lively discussion. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So I'm delighted to be able to um, introduce uh, Sandeep Roy today. Um, I think that I first met Sandeep when he was on stage when he was either six or eight years old. <laughs> he was the star of his class performance of Oliver Twist. <laughs> I could be wrong, but I think it was Oliver Twist. It was Oliver it was Twist. Oliver Twist. <laughs> Perils of knowing people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I should also uh, beg your pardon, because I'm going to be uh, slipping between calling him Sandeep and Shundeep. <laughs> because Shundeep is how I this is the Bengali way to refer to him, and I, I find that I go back and forth, but I'm sure you all will live with that. Um, but he was, at that time, and continued to be, the very epitome of what good middle-class Bengalis called um, the first boy. <laughs> middle-class Bengalis are obsessed with educational success, and the first boy is the boy who unfailingly tops the class. So he was the epitome of the first boy. I fell out of touch with him for about 30 years, and when we met again in California, he had turned away from living the first boy life. <laughs> yes, he was an engineer, as all good first boys must be, but he no longer worked as one. He was taking his first steps as a journalist while being active in Bay Area queer politics, which good first boys don't do. <laughs> <laughs> Shondeep was at that point the editor of Tricone, and he was the editor of Tricone magazine for many years, Tricone being the first South Asian LGBTQ organization in the Bay Area. He's been a longtime commentator on National Public Radio's Morning Edition. He has a weekly radio postcard for public radio um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's also an editor with New America Media and senior editor at firstpost.com uh, and a frequent contributor to Huffington Post. He's won several awards for his journalism and has contributed to many of the, I think, really major anthologies, the first anthologies uh, about sort of a queer South Asia. For, he, for me, Sandeep remains the man who never let the garland of flowers that gets permanently placed around your neck if you are the first boy in Bengal choke him. <laughs> Fortunately for the rest of us, he did not follow the path of most other first boys. He found his own freedom and his own path. And today he is here to talk to us about one of the results of the path that he has chosen, his wonderful first novel, Don't Let Him Know. So please join me in welcoming Sandeep Roy back to the Bay Area. This has to be the most norm. I've never been introduced in quite this way. <laughs> because you're hoping nobody remembers you as Oliver Twist. <laughs> no, the Oliver Twist, I'm okay with the first boy part. Is the one I'm trying to live down. That's the... Yeah, I also won a good conduct medal once. You won a good conduct medal. Yeah. Since yes. we were like in a sharing mode, I thought I'd throw it. And the reason I was there watching him was that he was a classmate of my of my brothers. And and you know, 
for years and years, my, bro my brother, you know, used to hear, why can't you be more like Sean? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's amazing I even have friends anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's actually start with your transition out of first boyhood <laughs> from, 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 from engineer to journalist. You know, so let's just start with, with that path and we'll eventually get to your book. Of course. Um, I, I became, as you said, you know, you become, you know, I became an engineer, I studied computer science, I came to America to do my master's following in all the sort of predestined kind of um, career points. Um, and I was working in Silicon Valley here, um, and I always wrote. I was, it was like kind of the thing you did in school, you edited the school magazine and stuff, but it was neither encouraged nor discouraged. It was fine as a hobby, and everyone said, oh, what a, you know, they might read something you wrote and say, like, oh, what a lovely thing you wrote, or whatever, you might win a prize for some essay or something, and it's nice, but you don't even dream about it as being any kind of a career option. It's always a hobby, something that you do on the side. And, uh, and after I came to the Bay Area, I was also doing some of that. Um, you know, I was writing for well, for Tricone, which was, and then India Currents, and I was, in fact, one of the first stories I was assigned to do w was to cover a film show of three short films around gender and sexuality in Ber at UC Berkeley for India Currents. I had, was one of my first assignments. Um, so I was doing that on the side and uh, going, and things were moving along, and I'll, I'll tell you the exact moment when it, like, all sort of, <coughs> jarred or, or fell into place, depending on how you look at it, is that I was having one of those annual performance reviews with my boss at my software company. And we've gone through a review, I've got, got my raise or whatever I was supposed to go, and you go through and they take you out for lunch, and at the end of it, he says, was the last question on the review was, where do you, so where do you see yourself five years from now? And I was just like blank. It was just supposed to be the question you ask while you're ordering dessert, you know, it's not an important question. I see myself as ex eminently successful as a cog in the machine of your company, <laughs> raising and hopefully you will have an IPO and, you know, and I will be, or I might be, you know, founded my own. At that time, they want, everyone wasn't find founding apps like, with, at the rate that people are doing now. But once that, I just couldn't see myself five years from now, anywhere. It was like looking over the abyss and it was blank. And I was just not there. And it wasn't a question of, oh, I need to find a different company, like hop to a different company. But it was just kind of like I couldn't <coughs> see. You know, it was just to use a computer terminology. It was just like the program was not compiling. <laughs> it was like compilation error. And so then I went back and I sort of had my little uh, nervous breakdown. <laughs> and it was truly a nervous breakdown yeah. because, you know, I had known nothing else. I felt equipped to do nothing else in my life. You know, I had no humanities education. I had, you know, I was, had gone through school, went through engineering. It like, it had all, like I had no life experience either. You know, it was like school, college, masters, it all went like tick, tick, tick. And so, you know, just the thought that I might not do this thing that you've been trained all your life to do was immensely scary. But uh, I had started working through India Currents actually with an organization called New America Media, which was based in the Bay Area and worked with different ethnic media organizations, India Current, India West, and all <coughs> this publication. And uh, the woman who ran it, a uh, very remarkable MacArthur genius named Sandy Close, um, I sort of went to her and I said, you know, and she said, well, you know, you could come and work for me. One of, one of her, the, the editors, uh, Vietnamese American writer named Andrew Lamb was going away on sabbatical and so they needed an editor. And uh, she was the kind of person who had the, you know, she didn't care that I didn't have any particular training in it. She just thought, oh, it's interesting, I like stories he tells, whatever. And she wanted to take a chance on me. And then there was, uh, they were just starting a radio show, and uh, 
I was a guest on that first radio show. I, I became the guest, the horror guest who went and became the host. <laughs> Maybe the host had not worked out. And so they were like, oh, do you want to try out for this radio show? And I was like, well, why not? I'm trying out for everything else. And so I tried out. I really enjoyed it. I, I started and so <clears throat> and before I knew it, I was hosting. So honestly, it's not a career path that I can uh, recommend to anybody because there was nothing pre ordained about it or nothing well thought out. I blundered into most of it. Um, and I'm lucky that much of it sort of worked out. But it's also because a lot of different people took a chance on, on me at some point. And it had nothing to do with being a first boy or anything. It was not, for none of those reasons. But people took a chance on me because they felt that, oh, you know, that maybe, like, let's try it. And I think more often than not, we don't do that with people because we look at the resume they came with and we assume that oh they that person you know obviously he had done, he didn't go to J school so what so uh, so then I became a journalist and then for the longest time and I've told this story before uh, longest time I did not tell my mother at that time my, my father had passed away but my mother that I had, uh, I told her I had changed jobs, I didn't tell her I had changed careers. <laughs> and uh, I kept it a secret for a while until I eventually had to come clean because my sister um, once finally called me and said, who knew? And she said, you know, I think she's getting suspicious, you have to tell her. Because she asked me, is he still in computers? And my sister very carefully said that, he still works with a computer. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is getting, uh, this is getting tissue thin, this line, and, you know. So it was, honestly, it was like a, it was more traumatic than coming out. <laughs> 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 coming out but now everybody's calmed down, everyone's okay with it. And now, of course, everyone wants to take full, like, oh, we always, he always wrote when he was a child. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the things that is so wonderful about you as a journalist um, is that you have a really light touch. The, you know, you, the topics are sort of resolutely progressive, but you're never, ever heavy-handed. And for those who read his columns on the first post, they have so much humor, you know, so much humanity. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to sort of ask you, how did you evolve into this kind of journalist? How do you pick the stories you do? Why do you tell the stories you do in that in the way that you do, I guess? I mean, I don't, you know, it's the, I, I, I've heard actually since this book has come out, several people have commented on you know, the phrase, the light touch has been used by, by several people. And I take it as an enormous compliment. It's nothing by design at all. I just tell the stories the way I'm used to telling the stories. Um, and, but it was always true that, that I wanted to tell the story and not, and if as a result or in course of telling that story, some larger point message was being made, that was great. But I didn't want to make the message the story, you know, I wanted to the story. And this, some of it came out of working in radio and doing radio pieces where you you felt like you had to this you had to take a listener into a world that they were not familiar with make them at somewhat at ease and you know I used to do stuff I would do stuff for National Public Radio Morning Edition and the the rule there was you couldn't say anything that would cook and it's morning edition people are having breakfast so the rule was like you couldn't say anything that would make them spill their coffee or like go off there so I remember once doing a story about street food in Berkeley actually big chart house and all of that and we had a line in there I was talking about like how I go back to India and now you know now I'm like an um, expat so my stomach I can't eat street food the same way and I had some line in there about going back and getting the runs, having the runs or something. And there was this whole like editorial conferencing happening across uh, the country between various editors as to whether we could see having the runs early, so that early in the morning when people are having breakfast and stuff. So, but so you have to be very gentle with people in telling the story. So I'm like, uh, I guess some, some of it is a little sneaky in, in Bangla we say Michke, where you, you know, you, you appear sweet, but perhaps you're not quite so sweet. <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of it is, I really, you know, this is something having worked 
with organizations in the Bay Area and, and I've often felt that many really excellent non-governmental NGOs that work here get so, as a journalist trying to cover the issues, I've always struggled with the fact that they're often so bogged down by the worthiness of the mission that they forget to tell the story that humanizes what, and as a journalist, I, you know, I, I'm like, I'm with you, I'm on your side on this issue, I want to get this message across, but if you can tell me this message in the form of a story, which actually has an arc and which has a character that I can relate to, I can actually convey this much more strongly than if you give me what you do in a string of isms and you know like this is the way the world should be and we're against this and that because then it just becomes then for a listener it, it just gets uh, this cloud of noise and and so I've always tried to find a story and and people have asked me about the characters in this book as well and I've like always been convinced that I didn't want any character in the book to be an identifiable villain or something that even if they do things that seem bad choices that that is right. I should be able to empathize with them, otherwise what's the point of creating a character at all? So moving, thank you for that. So moving to the book, when did you decide that you wanted to write not only a book but this book? Uh -huh. I don't think I decided it. Um, it sort of happened. It, it, a lot of people have asked me, and it has surprised me, a lot of people ask me, I didn't know you were writing fiction. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is, this is like, I didn't know you were gay. Is <laughs> 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 that some closet? <laughs> I'm like, I was a journalist. Not, is, is, because, but there is this whole idea that, oh, you're a journalist. And then, I, and I thought like the big, for me having come from computer science, the big thing was that I was writing at all. And that I was <laughs> writing that something that was, that I was not, you know, I was like writing computer programs and then I started writing words. words which, and so that was my big leap. So within that, the fact that I was writing fiction versus non-fiction, I never thought about it that much. I was, that's interesting. Why would you not think of it as, as, as different? I mean, I think it's very interesting. I, and I know that's me. I've had to think about that. And I probably, the answer is because the kind of, especially working in radio and stuff, the kind of journalism mm. I was doing was always mm. about storytelling. It was mm. always about looking for the story. And even, I mean, I didn't go to J school or anything. So I, even at uh, New York Media and Pacific News of View, we worked our editorial meetings in the morning, you know. It was always about what is the story. My uh, boss, uh, Sandy, and I actually have some colleagues here from the new. Remember, it was our joke in our newsroom that she would drag into the meeting some, you know, some person she had met on a cab or a bus <laughs> the week before, and she'd just been sort of so fascinated by whatever story they were saying before you knew it, this person was in the meeting, and they were trying to get them to write a piece and. and but that's the issue. She was really has a passion for, for the story. So I've always been much more interested in the story. So to me, fiction was another way of, of storytelling. And non-fiction radio, I was always trying to tell a story with an arc that had a beginning and an end. So that way, I didn't think of it that much. But I thought, but I was writing some fiction. And at one point, I realized that what I was writing as sort of vignettes, it were actually part of one larger story, which was this novel. It was they were not discrete. And for people who haven't read the the book, it, it is a novel, but it is written in story. So each each chapter is almost like a standalone story. And and I, I like that format because it allowed me it allowed me room. It allowed me room to piece, write it in pieces, and 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 it it created interesting gaps for me within the book, which uh, which I could leave for a reader to imagine what happens because I don't have to didn't have to join everything together, and um, and then the book, you know, I wrote much of the book here, um, but it happened, it came to life in, in India, I finished it in India, and a publisher in India 
actually asked me about it and you know, it was again as I said my life is a series of blundering into things so this like I hadn't shopped it around or anything I had seen shown it to a couple of agents here but nothing more than that and then in India a publisher found it and she really liked it and wanted to publish it and then it got <laughs> so I don't want to give the plot away and I was just saying to Shondeep earlier that I'm, I've never actually done this with somebody who's written a, f a work of fiction but usually I do this with people who've written, you know, um, the, you know, sort of um, history or sociology or whatever and so there isn't a plot to give away. <laughs> so I said I'm very anxious, I don't want to give the plot away. So why don't we begin by you telling us what you want people to know about the book before they've read it. Oh, I'll read, can I read just the read the blurb? <laughs> <laughs> no, that doesn't count. Give us something else. Um, I would say that the book, uh, what I want them to know is, you know, this wasn't the hardest thing. I, when I first, the book was coming out and someone said, like, you have this question. I, oh, you're writing a book. What's, What's your book about? about? And I was like, Ugh. <laughs> my book is about, and everything I said <laughs> sounded like the most dull, boring, it's about this immigrant family. Oh, God, this is like, <laughs> it's about this woman. And it's like, oh, not, nothing seemed like, you know, like, what is it about? But in the end, I would say this is a book about family secrets. Is, um, because it is about two generations, really, of a family. And it goes back and forth in time, following their, each of their individual stories from when they were kids to as their lives as adults. And they all have secrets. Some secrets are big, some secrets are small. Um, some secrets they keep from each other because they think it would devastate and tear the family apart if it came out. Some secrets they keep to themselves because it's like a delicious, guilty pleasure that they want to savor on their own and they don't feel like they can share with other people. But it is all about secrets and it is about, it is actually about what appears to be a very happy family and uh, you know sort of a model family and in many ways it is a happy family and it is a contented family except it's like a petri dish of secrets so, so it's basically me absorbing for that good conduct medal you know like trying to <laughs> <laughs> trying to get that thing off my back um, but it, but it's but it, I, I mean I'm joking about it but it is really about also the things that people we do to each other as family members because we love each other and because we don't want to hurt each other. And so there are many sacrifices, bad choices, half choices that these people make. And, it, and the book opens with Romola, who is now widowed in a suburb in sort of Silicon Valley, visiting her computer engineer son, true to the cliche. And, uh, but, 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 he's not just a computer engineer son, he wants, he also has a secret, he wants to become a chef. A chef. <laughs> yes. so they all have a yes. secret, and so the son has discovered a piece of an old letter from a, among his mother's things, which he thinks is a letter from an old lover. And so the son thinks suddenly he has discovered this secret about his mother, which is like, opened up a whole new way of looking at the mother. Because of course we do not want to think that our parents had any kind of lives before we existed. And so it's opened up. But of course he doesn't know that the secrets to have secrets and that letter, was it really meant for his mother? Why was it in a, among her things? And can she actually tell him the full story of that letter? And that is sort of the way the book is structured where you as a reader Every chapter as you go along, you uncover more of the secrets, so you know more about what's going on than any of the characters in the book who, like as in all families, we only know half the story. You know, we know the bits that we've surmised, that we've guessed, and that we've assumed about the families. And it goes back and forth in time, looking at Ramola, her husband Avinash, and their son Omit, and the secrets they've carried back and forth across generations. So, so keeping with the theme of secrets, um, you know, let's let's just talk a little bit about the big secret because because, because this is you know the, the core of the book, which is that um, Romola's husband is gay. Um, and I've been thinking about the secrets which we, 
you know, I, I thought a lot, you know, do South Asian families keep more secrets than other families? Yes. Uh, do all families have secrets? But again, all these people do nothing. You know, do all families have secrets? But we think ours are worse. I mean, what is it? Is it so the secret telling, um, keeping the, your sexuality a secret, especially if you're gay, is certainly not unique to South Asian right. families, right? But I, I, you know, I, I'm sort of thinking about the idea of secrets and families, and when you know when secrets actually bind families together, and when secrets destroy families, mm. um, and just to have you reflect on that a little bit, perhaps through Avinash, what would have happened? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, that's, I'm glad you put it that way because secrets both bind and uh, destroy families. And I've, I've said this half jokingly, but I also sort of mean it half seriously in, in that what is different for our, for, in South Asia, given the way the family structure is, is that when I came to America, this whole notion of coming out was an immensely sort of individual uh, idea. And the, and the quintessential image that you had of coming out, um, which I... Mm, was of this person, maybe in a small Midwestern town, who decides to come out and as a result of this purchases the one-way ticket on a Greyhound bus and goes to New York's West Village or to San Francisco's Castro. And that is the coming out journey. Yeah. It's a one-way ticket out of the family to the big city. Yeah. And in India, often, when you come out, it sort of means that the whole family goes into the closet with you. <laughs> <laughs> they all go into the closet, they all shut the door, and so the whole thing becomes That's a little like you know, big. Like, like, expand the closet. Yeah, yeah. Expand the closet, and it's like, and uh, I mean, when, when I came out, the first conversation immediately was like, well, okay, you can't tell so and so, and you can't tell your aunt, and then you can't tell, you know, it became a list of the people you can't tell. I was like, oh, you already told, already done. But, 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 I, <laughs> but that becomes the the conversation because <clears throat> because it's about keeping up you know it's also a lot about keeping up appearances the, about keeping up the the facade of the the good happy family and stuff so these secrets <clears throat> carry a lot more weight and baggage they're potentially you know kind of far more feel far more explosive uh, to you I mean I have so many such friends who say like I can't come out because my parents would just die and you know it, usually our hearts are a little stronger than that but but even when I was going to tell my parents my friend school school friend who's a doctor said okay well tell me which day you're going to tell them because that day I'll make sure I'm at home <laughs> in case that we need medical help or <laughs> but uh, so in the character of Avinash I wanted to show this story of this man who's very much a creature of his time you know of a man for whom I would imagine that his uh, attraction to men would be a source of not just trauma, but also immense puzzlement for him. Like he didn't, wouldn't know what to do with him. There's no internet, there is no place for him to meet other like-minded persons. There's nothing he can really read about it. There are no groups, there's no bar. If he stumbles upon a, some kind of cruising area, that too would have to happen by accident. He wouldn't really know, nobody would be telling him where he could meet other people. <clears throat> he might, you know, might have an old school friend or somebody with whom he had some kind of affair that would, might not last into adulthood. It might yeah. be a sort of boy's thing which goes and one person might be left traumatized by that feeling. So I had a lot of empathy for him, even as like many men, he may in the end end up in a marriage, and you could say it's a horrible thing to do to the to the woman who is in the marriage, and of course it is. But that doesn't mean that he's also a complete callous, cold-hearted villain for doing that. He's much, and and in the book, I do show through his character a little bit of how things have changed. So in the end, you do have a scene of him going to a very different India now. Mm. Where there is a, you know, there's a much more vibrant gay scene and he goes to a gay party, which is actually commonplace in India right now. They, you know, they'll have Valentine's Day parties and this and you pay your 500 rupees and it's, you know, and, and you get two drinks and maybe some little food and, and all these gay men and 
so confident about themselves. You know, men not from my background and, you know, who went to Jesuit schools and uh, in speak English well. They come from small towns in Boranogo or wherever. They've taken local trains to come in, come to this event. And they are more confident and flamboyant even about their sexuality than than people of my background ever would be. We were all very much more concerned about passing and nervous about being in these people just, you know, they like literally, and I look at them like, what do they do in, in real life? You know, like what kind of job? They're like strutting and sashing and very, very confident, like uh, almost alarmingly so for people of Avinash's generation. And I could imagine, like I had this imagination of somebody like him in middle age going into one of these party scenes, right? And, uh, and what must be going through his mind at that moment where he would feel, and I was, just talking about this in an interview, where you go in and you see this whole world that is this sort of into this wonderland that has opened up in your backyard. You know, this is not in San Francisco, it's happening in Calcutta or Bombay. And you feel, you wonder what your life would have been like if this had been there 20 years ago. And you, I mean, there must be enormous poignancy in, in being both being around to witness it and feeling that it came a little too late for you. Yeah, it's that, that one. The, that's one of the most painful chapters of the, of the book because he can't manage that. After all, I'm going to ask just a couple more questions, and I know that you, you know people must be waiting for you to read, uh, read. But I, um, you know, I was thinking about why this book. This book really moved me Thank profoundly um, and it wasn't just the story and I realized why it, it moved me it's that you know this was actually a book written by somebody of my generation from my city and you were described and, and the things you described the tastes the smells the textures mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I have read too many books which so accurately describe the tastes, sounds, textures, and smells of, of my childhood. So, you know, you and I, we grew up reading Enid Blyton, right? You know, we grew up reading books about uh, England. And if we read books about, in Bengali, there were often classical books about rural Bengal. So in our childhood, there really wasn't that much literature that was about us. Mm. You know, the, the <laughs> urban people that we were. And so when, you know, so, you know, as a child, I could imagine, you know, going off and trying to imagine what a potted meat sandwich tasted like, and all the children seemed to read in the books that I read, or go off on a caravan, whatever that was, you know. We would those and how horrific the potted meat sandwich was finally when you ate it. Yeah, but you know, we didn't, we didn't, you know, we just would fantasize, right? Nobody was eating rishti you know, or, or, or chaat, right? So I, I just began thinking about especially in the chapter on, your great, uh, on the great-grandmother. You know, I began thinking, you know, this enormous bed on which a little boy can just sort of pile up these pillows, these enormous beds, right? You can pile up pillows and play all these, you know, secret war games, or you can smell the mango chutney being cooked, or imagine the there flies. There is mango in the book, true to a South <laughs> Yes, <laughs> mango chutney, and, and you can just, like, oh, it's delicious, you know. Um, the cucumber sandwich is getting smushed with the sandesh in your lunchbox. I mean, it was these sorts of things that were so, um, it just really got into, mm. uh, got into my skin. And I wondered if you sort of, since we grew up, you know, pretty uh, roughly the same generation, sort of this sense of writing for your generation. Um, as somebody who, and this is a book that, that does exactly, it crosses, it, it crosses continents, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, you, you place it deliberately in the, both the places you know best. Um, so talk a little bit about sort of, about place and smell and belonging, I guess. Um, you know, I don't know if, you guys, some of you must have seen this, it was recently, there was this very quite funny article that was reproduced in many places, including the aerogram, and it was about, sort of the checklist of what makes a South Asian novel, right? And it, and it was, it had like, oh, it has mangoes in it. <laughs> and it has arranged marriage, of course. Then there is a feisty grandmother, and I was going through the checklist. I was like, oh, 
Damn, I have all of those things in my room. <laughs> and I wasn't trying to like, you know, Jerry Man, like create like create a novel by num by numbers. But the reason those things are in there Akar, is because a lot of those things are integral and intrinsic to my experience of this childhood. You know, I grew up around I, the, I had a great grandmother who was around till I was 14 or 15. I have vivid memories of her, you know. She did make pickles and chutneys at home, something nobody does anymore, you know. So that's important. And, you know, you, you know my parents were in, had an arranged marriage where they saw each other. So those things are all part of the reality. You, know, you don't have to manufacture them in order to, you know, write a book that, uh, that yeah, but I guess the question becomes, are you doing it because they are integral to your story that, that you're trying to tell, or whether you're doing it because that's part of what needs to be there, you know, for marketing purposes or something. But for me, it was very, very important to be able to capture um, that sense of place and smell of, of, a, of an India that we almost haven't noticed is gone, you know, and it's only by... I mean, many people have said this in that writing is an act of remembering. And uh, like when I was writing about the the great grandmother in this book, she I had to summon up my own great grandmother. And the character in the book is not my great grandmother. This what happens to her, her dilemmas, her her things are different from what was my great-grandmother's story. But my great-grandmother's image was the image I had in my head. I had to, you know, I could hear her voice in my ear. When, um, when she, you know, when, when she was late in her 90s, she lived into her mid-90s, chomping with her own teeth to the very end, you know, and eating all kinds of forbidden food, like the great-grandmother in my deep-fried food that she was absolutely not supposed to eat. She would bribe people to go and buy it for her. <laughs> but she, uh, but I, you know, we used to, TV, she used to do the Sharshuti Puja for the Goddess of Learning every year. And, uh, we taped her on a little old cassette recorder. We we taped her saying the the mantra, and which is, and I can I still know it because it's Golai Gajamuti Mukta Har Jama Sharshuti Vidya Bhar Lak Lak Vidya Murkante Tha Jabo Jibon Shukera. This Bengali poem is ingrained in my head because, and it's not just the words that are ingrained. Her voices, voices in there, and. Uh, you know, we used to, after she died, we used to play this tape recorder, my sister and I, when we did the puja every year, and, and eventually the tape warped, and it was gone. Mm -hmm. But the voice sort of remains half forgotten, but it was lovely to, when I was writing it, to remember it again. And that was that sense <coughs> of place and time, and then once you start remembering, you remember more things, you know. You you remember little more, little details that you that were long lost, and you realize like oh, nobody <coughs> does that anymore. Nobody makes that anymore, and that's where like you you know we talk about food and all of this, and it's become a cliche. You talk about when you talk about any kind of immigrant experience, you go towards the food and things like that. But that's <coughs> because so much of our memory is preserved in that in that food. In the you know I have a, there are a lot of um, in the book, there are a lot of characters who are the servants, the domestic helps, and the maids, and and I wanted a lot of the interactions between the children, the child Amit and thing, to be actually with the domestic help because that is how we grew up. I mean, we can sort of you know now we kind of sugarcoat it and say like, oh, they were part of the family and uh, like a practical family. It's not. There was a clear class difference and all of that, but that doesn't mean that it was so feudal that you didn't have intense relationships with and those were some of the things that I wanted to capture in the book with without making like you know I'm not trying to make heavy points about whether it's good or bad but that's just the way it was. Well in fact you, I was my next question was it going to be about domestic servants? Uh, because you've written a book about it. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yes partly was but, but I mean they play such an important role in many of the stories and they're woven in seamlessly but I think your stories show both how powerful the relations of affection were and 
relations of domination. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that that's really, really clear. And, and also, I think what's startling, you write with such clarity, <coughs> the very cruel ways in which children can become instruments of class oppression. Mm. You know, that they, these are their best friends and at the same time, in order to, get, to talk away out of trouble, you blame somebody whose their life is then ruined, right? It's, but, but the thoughtless ways in which children can do that, and I just thought that was, that was really a, a remarkable part of your book. I'm glad, I'm really glad you brought it up because in fact, Many of the reviews and things don't, you know, they, they because they focus on the structure of the book or they focus on uh, the sexuality stuff and they don't mention the, you know, the, like some and some always in the background, you know, they're bringing the tea and then you don't like notice that they're there. I'm glad you brought it up because I, it was that was something that I wanted to do very deliberately because we also tend to romanticize it very much sometimes. Like oh you know the the faithful family, yeah. the faithful mm -hmm. family servant or we do the go the other way where it is an horrible exploitative feudal relationship but in many ways it is both and and just because the person works as a servant it's also I mean this is a book about secrets and nobody is privy to more secrets <laughs> than the people who work in the house and you know they sometimes use it to their advantage. And sometimes it gets used against them. But when push comes to shove, eventually the class difference and the power difference will play. But but until it comes to that point, and I have grown up around uh, around people who were like cooks and maids, who have uh, you know were very strong people and and pushed the extent of power that they could yeah. as far as because they knew also that the house was not going to run without them. You know, especially when when somebody was getting very elderly or something, there, there was a lot of power there as well. I'm going to ask you one final question, and that is, the end of the book is really remarkable because I think it shows that there are possibilities of change and acceptance and joy that uh, that ha one has when one is older that one did not have or could not see or could not take when you were younger. Um, Tell me a little bit about why you ended the way you did. Was that what you were thinking? Well, now that you put it so nicely, <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't that. No, I, I was, I mean, the book sort of, uh, just not to give very much away, but the, in the book, Romola, my character, initially comes to America as a young bride to a small Midwestern town called Carbondale, which is where she finds out stuff about her husband and things that she didn't know and would have rather not known. And uh, the book ends with her back in Carbondale as a vi visiting because her son lives in America and wants you know, to sh show the grandson where the grandmother came. And, and in that way, Romula's a little different from the stereotype because she, un I mean, while she's like the widow who's come to America, which is very commonly someone's mother coming from India, she actually had a whole past history in America long before this son was born, you know, which we don't always, that's not the case. And uh, so she comes back to this same town. And that was the one moment where I, you know, that chapter was one moment where I actually sort of felt like I wanted to let the character off leash, my writer Lee leash, and let her discover, you know, and see what happened with it. And it's very, the, the title of the book comes from a quote in Alice in Wonderland. And when I was writing that, I very much had Alice in Wonderland in my head, where I wanted that chapter to feel somewhat dreamy and surreal, and you're sort of inside her head. And it's up to you to, you know, some people have read it and wondered how much of it is real and how much of it is sort of, uh, dream, wish fulfillment, and some people have read it as the, as completely this is what happened. And uh, if you ask me what it was, I would say I don't know, because I wanted that chapter to actually have a bit of that characteristic of a dream. But mostly, I felt like this woman deserved the gin and tonic right now, and damn it, she's going to get her gin and tonic and before this book is over, and she got it. Thank you really so much. Um, Let's turn it over to... Uh, Shall I read? Okay. Yeah, please do. Well, would, will I, what do you want? Shall I read from the McDonald's part or shall I read from an India part? 
South Asian you part or US do part? Do you want a part set in the US or you want a part set in India? Mango pickup? Oh, you want a mango part? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a mango part. Good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay. It's not quite the mango, but there's fruit here, so I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is in India. Mm. I will not have it, said Romola. Not in this house while I'm alive. I have told her once, I have told her a thousand times, I will not have jackfruit in my house. <laughs> the smell makes me want to throw up. But did you find any? Asked his father, Avinash, trying to be rational. Find any? You think she was born yesterday? She's eaten every last bit, she and that old maid of hers. But the smell, my whole refrigerator smells like it was bathed in it. Well, it's done now, said Avinash placatingly, unwilling to forsake his newspaper and step into the fight. But Ramallah was not to be appeased. You think it's just for me? What about her? At her age, eating so much ripe jackfruit? She looked at her mother-in-law for support, but Amit's grandmother had told Ramallah a long time ago that she did not want to handle the old lady's demands anymore. So Ramallah looked at Avinash and muttered, if tomorrow she has an upset stomach, you clean up. She is your precious grandmother after all. Amit's Boroma, his great-grandmother, was 94. She still had her own teeth, with a few missing here and there. When it suited her, she was blind. When she did not want to hear something, she was deaf. At other times, she would prop the thick black frame glasses with their almost cloudy yellowish lenses on her hooked nose and peer at the newspaper with great concentration. Her favorite section was the obituaries, which she read with ghoulish, ghoulish relish. Horihar Shastri died, she would announce, looking at Ramula chopping vegetables for lunch. He used to come to study under your grandfather-in-law. He was a full 12 years younger than me. <laughs> but today, great-grandmother was in her helpless, sightless mode, as if her very spine had crumpled inside her. She sat on her bed, her plain white sari following, falling off her wrinkled shoulders and peered up at Avinash. Jackfruit, black fruit, she bleated mournfully. When your grandfather still had the house in the village, we had jackfruits the size of bolsters growing in our own courtyard and all the mangoes we could ever want. Do you remember? Ma, you make it sound like a zamindari plantation, said Amit's grandmother. I just remember a couple of mango trees. You really do exaggerate. But great-grandmother carried on undeterred. Oh, there is a lot of mango here. We had, we had fresh mangoes, mango chutney, mango pickles, mango squash, even homemade mango ice cream. Where will I get that anymore? Have I legs that I'll go walking? Have I my own money that I'll buy myself anything? As Avinash awkwardly patted his grandmother on her shoulder and fixed her sari, Ramala standing near the doorway muttered darkly, No legs? That woman has eight legs. <laughs> Amit imagined great-grandmother as an ancient toothless spider crawling from room to room and giggled. Hearing him, Ramala said, Come here, I feel a white hair growing. Pluck it out carefully. Mind it, don't go pulling out all my black hairs too. Ramal often complained that her hair was turning white from looking after all of them. Amit and his father and his grandmother and his great-grandmother. Your school ends at three, your office ends at six, she would tell Amit and his father in exasperation. My duties never end. Great-grandmother survived the jackfruit without any upset stomach. She could digest iron, said Ramala with <laughs> grudging admiration. It's all that unadulterated milk she drank in her day, Amit's grandmother added. Great-grandmother won, mother zero, Amit tallied in his head, as if it was a football match. He wondered sometimes why his great-grandmother and mother always seemed to be butting heads. Does Ma hate Boroma? he asked his father once. No, of course not, laughed his father. They both think they're the boss of the house, but they both love you very much. That Amit knew when great-grandmother sent the old maid Mongola out to get thick slices of batter-fried aubergine from Dasu's tea stall down the street, she'd always sneak Amit a slice. He wasn't supposed to eat street food, but great-grandmother said, that was nonsense. You have to build the boy's immunity, she would tell Ramala. You can't just shelter him. Why, when I was a child, why, yes, yes, grandmother, when you were a child, the world was ruled by the British and the cooking oil was pure, said Ramala. <laughs> Amit has school tomorrow. He can't afford to have a stomach upset. But the next day, when she picked Amit up from the kindergarten, she bought him a chocolate pastry from the bakery on their way back. There, said Ramola, isn't this much better than some oily, gutter-fried aubergine? As he licked the chocolate icing, Amit thought contentedly that if he played his cards right, <laughs> he could have both. <laughs> Yeah, why don't we open it up uh, for questions?
Yeah, you said you didn't have any humanities education, but I assume you read some literature as an adult. So I'm just curious as to what writers you might say you were influential when you started writing or just ones that you particularly enjoy reading? Um, I always have a difficult time with that because I think more than writers, it's often books that I've enjoyed reading. So, you know, I I was just saying, like, so when I first read uh, Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things, I was really blown away by the just the lushness of the language. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean I will necessarily always agree with her politics or everything else she's writing. I mean, of course, if she writes another novel one day, as you keep hearing rumors that she's doing, I will definitely be interested in, in reading it. Um, or by the same token, I mean, if you look at sort of a writer's entire body of work, I would have to sort of shamefacedly say that the, you know, it's it's like an Enid Blyton, Agatha Christie, and Gerald Durrell are the people I've read way more comprehensively than than anybody else. But but you know, this recent this Facebook thing that was going on when people were saying tag the ten books that changed your life, and people would keep tagging me on it, and I would resolutely refuse to participate in that because I was looking at that list and I was telling my friend. You you did not read Remembrance <laughs> of Things, but you have not read Ulysses. I mean, yes. I not finished Ulysses. Like, don't go around. And it's like changed your life. And and a lot of these books happen. I mean, when I first read Midnight's Children, I did not understand it. I was just like, this is a very confusing book. But th that's a book that, in hindsight, you know, I realized like when I first read it as sort of in college or whatever, I was not ready at all for a book like that. And it was almost like I had to read other Rushdi to come back to Midnight's Children to sort of understand what it really meant and how influential it was in changing. But, you know, and then you would read um, some a book like when I read Michael Cunningham's The Hours um, in the the first section when it was the Virginia Woolf one without really knowing very much, having read very much of Virginia Woolf at all. In, I remember just reading and rereading that description of her committing suicide with the stones in her pocket and I just, it was just like so prof I mean I just couldn't get past that because I would keep rereading it. It doesn't mean that the next book by Michael Cunningham affected me exactly this uh, as much or more but uh, but to me, it's like always a, a profound gift when you find a book, no matter what it is, that suddenly speaks to you in you know very unexpected ways, and you just take it. And I don't, you know, I I don't like if the writer writes something later that disappoints me, I don't begrudge them because I'm glad they wrote that one book that made me happy and says I hope people will say that about. Me. My book later books. <laughs> if you like this one, just remember you like this one. <laughs> you hate anything else. <laughs> Any other questions? You can ask about mangoes too. It's fine. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Congratulations. Thank you. So I just wanted to ask you, how do you, you know, when I first came to the country, this country, which was nearly four years ago. Um, there was no Indian literature or South Asian literature. There was the media portrayed India in terms uh, that contained mostly snake charmers mm -hmm. and sacred cows and things like that. Now there are so many South Asian writers. South Asians are so hip, you know, Indians are so hip. And so how do you see yourself in the in the canon of South Asian literature. <laughs> if you, you know, I mean, how do you be that view that whole thing? No I and you don't know, I mean, Sarita has been writing a, year, a column for India. How, how long have you been writing that now? Nearly 25 years. 25 years. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. quite something, you yeah. know, to be, you know, to be consistently writing a column. And how many other people, are, columnists are, you know, doing it for 25 years and, and sort of chronicling how our sort of diaspora and experience has been changing. And honestly, I, you know, obviously I don't see myself in a 
in the canon at all. I mean, the book is like barely not even a month old. Um, but but w what I'd say is that the number of writers out there now you, it feels like somebody told me once that oh, if you get on a subway in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. it's like you can't not bump into an Indian writer. They all live in Brooklyn <laughs> and they're all taking the subway all the time and you're just bumping into them up there. But there are, but the, so yeah, at one level you would say like it's also overexposed, everyone's writing about this stuff, you know, there's nothing new to say anymore. Nobody ever says that about the white suburban yeah, experience, right? Would. You know, nobody says. Um, but but the, what is great about all these voices out there is that it's immensely freeing and liberating for somebody like me writing a book and because I feel very little pressure in this book about having to represent anybody which was like the great burden 20 years ago yeah. when you were people were writing only about snake charmers and cow if you were South Asian to write about your people was the immense burden of representation was coming in. So even, even, even when I'm discussing something around sexuality and gay life, even there, like in a minority within a minority, I am not worrying about whether, like, oh, will my character of Avinash now be held up as the prototype of the South Asian gay man and all the entire South Asian LGBT movement will be judged by the failings of this one character. I can actually have that kind of freedom yeah. to treat them as characters with you know nuances and good and bad and shades of grey and, and let them follow their own destiny without having to follow the, you know, uphold the pride of a billion people. So I <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, answer yes. I'm curious if the uh, device you use of going back and forth in time was originally a <coughs> concept, or did you at first try, try it chronologically and then decide you wanted to, or was it a device that was dictated by the fact that it makes the secrets more, uh, I guess, uh, dramatic and, and intriguing uh, by going back and forth in time? How did you come to that decision to do that? I came to that decision... Uh, we or we organ you know i had written as you've seen the acknowledgments some versions of some of these stories had appeared these chapters had appeared as standalone stories in other anthologies but in completely different form perhaps with different characters or written in first person as opposed to third person and somebody far more perceptive than me read some of them and said you know stop kidding yourself you're really writing about the same people you're really writing a novel you're just writing you know you're looking at small, it's like the, what is the six blind men and the elephant, you know, I was looking at different parts of the elephant. And uh, so once I sat down and thought about that and digested what that meant, it meant revisiting everything to figure out like, oh, this is like a whole new jigsaw puzzle now. And these are actually pieces that fit into the puzzle. And I organizationally, if you see like the first three chapters, are actually built around this letter that I was talking about. And they sort of set it in the current contemporary time frame. This is the letter. And then after that, it became almost a natural thing to step back and go into, like, do the rewind, as in the, the flashback. So then it became important to sort of go into the backstories of these characters. And, and the thing that having each chapter be like a standalone story allowed me to do was in a way I could devote this whole chapter to Romola's story or Abhinash's story or Amit's story and, and focus on their life. And, I, and it became important to go back in that story because I was seeing almost unwittingly that there were certain patterns emerging from that childhood story which would be reflected again in their current life. So in, as an example, I would say the great-grandmother bit that I read out in a later portion of that chapter, she deals with a lot of these issues around widowhood and what you're supposed to do, rules about what you eat and what you don't eat, which is dealt with in, in that time frame. But Romola, who 20 years later or 30 years later, is also going to confront some of these same decisions. And it will come up in different ways. You know, you could say, and you 
hopefully as you read the book, you'll see some of these patterns emerge and it's like you sort of see what is happening right now and then maybe when you read the flashback part, you will see a little echo. I, can you have an echo in a flashback? No, it's the other way around. No. <laughs> the, an echo of, of what happened in that flashback and hopefully it'll make for a slightly richer experience. Uh, yes, or at the back of the view. And so, after finishing the book, there were many characters that I wish I had uh, learned more, like uh, Avinashi's gay friend, or uh, Avinashi's mom, that she's in kind of squeeze between yeah. those two strong women. So I wonder if you also had many more stories to tell, but at some point you had to finish the book and then uh, <laughs> leave some stories out. No, some of the things I want, you know, yeah, obviously, I mean, there is a character, Avinash's gay friend, Sumit, who sort of really appears in one thing. And he appears in certain other ways. At, at one point, uh, Amit asks his mother, oh, shall we try and track down Sumit, um, you know, in America? And that was really me almost questioning whether I wanted to bring him back into my narrative. And then I decided not to because it would become too much like trying to tie up all the loose ends and I wanted you know I'd rather <laughs> that somebody like you read the book and say I wish I had learned more there was more about this character of Sumit rather than someone turn around and say like oh god there was way too much of that Sumit <laughs> guy in, the, in this book you know and um, so I want and the way it's structured, because it's structured with each chapter as a story, there are a lot of gaps between the stories, you know, they, because it's not like a novel where everything is joined together and all the connections are made clear. And so as a reader, you have to imagine some of <coughs> what happened in these characters' lives in these gaps. And, uh, you know, and I understand, recognize that for some people that might be kind of frustrating because they want to know what happened. What did she say to him when she discovered? And for, but for some, for me, it was kind of nice to. It was it was almost like these lives were happening, and I would periodically, you know, take a little cross section of this life and present it to you, and then we'd go away and let these characters go on with their lives for a little while, and then we'll come back again and see how you know how things were progressing so it wasn't that i had very many more stories but i could have had many more stories but i i wanted i actually wanted certain gaps there and i wanted some characters to be there almost as cameo appearances but hopefully still leave an impact on the story i'm just curious uh, have your parents read the, read the book and uh, what's been their reaction if my uh, my my mother uh, my father has passed away, but my um, I gave when the galleys came I gave it with great trepidation to my mother and sister, <laughs> and um, my mother had been saying like oh so your book first you know when the book deal had happened she was very excited and very happy and was like okay when can I tell the aunts <laughs> right, so once, once that was over he's writing a book then she was like okay. She had only read before that the great grandmother's uh, chapter uh, in a different form, and she she loved that thing because it really brought back her own memories of uh, my great grandmother. Though she said, "Oh, that character, that mother in that book, yeah, you know, it, uh, I was never as mean to your great grandmother." And I was like, "Oh, it's fiction, you know, it's not fiction, it's not you." And so then. Uh, so she, then she was just like, I don't know, so you're writing this book, it's great, but God knows what kind of hijibiji, hodgepodge you're writing, who knows what kind. Um, so then she read it and she was remarkably quiet about it and saying nothing. And I'm like, I'm not, I am not asking her, she is not telling me. But then she would suddenly occasionally ask me about an ending in a chapter. Why did you do that? Why did you say this? And... Uh, when I, after I did a book launch in Calcutta, and she went to an event somewhat like this, where we talked about the book, and she went, and then she came back, and she said, I'm now going to read the book again. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, I read it first, just sort of, you know, just to see what you'd written. But now I'm, I'm going to read it again, because I, I want to read it more slowly. Because now that I know that everything that's, that's happened. And uh, 
she, you know, she sort of, it's a, it's not an, e I, I, it's not an easy book for her to no, read. No, it can't be. It's not an easy book. Mm -hmm. um, because it is, it, reading the book in a way is acknowledgement that your son has grown up. You know, it, it talks about things that we don't talk about mm -hmm. at, at home. Mm -hmm. You know, even it's not non-fiction, it's not a memoir, so there's no family secrets being thing in the book. But it's just topics that we don't talk about. And uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes we write these books because we don't talk, we can't talk about them otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Hi, so in, in leaving out portions of the book, you were, in Bengali, as we call it, being a Michke Shaita, <laughs> so, you know, which is a mischievous criminal, if you were, you know, yeah. answering it directly. And I, I had a question, not just a comment. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, your life as a software engineer, you know, did that, you know, your life in Silicon Valley have a bearing, um, and what kind of bearing did it have when you were in the writing process? Um... It did actually. Well, I, I'll say one thing. Like sometimes I wonder, like what I would have done if I wasn't, if I didn't become a software engineer. And you know, I think like oh, I spent ten years doing this, and uh, were they like wasted years? And then it, I think they were not, because in the end, it's all about certain amount of experience that you gain. And if I had not, if from my generation, my time, from my sort of our family back, middle class family background. If I had not become a software engineer, I probably would not have come to the United States. You know, I probably would not, you know, many things in my life would may not have transpired in the way. You know, I may have studied English and become a professor in India and not really written this. I mean, this book could not, would, this book would not have been possible without me coming here. But the one thing I would say that the software engineering actually, the role is, it actually helps me, like, I think very logically. I'm very methodical and I need it to all follow a, step A will be step B, then step C. I can't write anything, even now if I write an article, I can't write it until I have a first sentence and a last sentence in my head. And then I can, you know, then I, once those are in place, I can sort of join them together and I know how to get from here to there. And in the process of it, the last sentence might change its position and move it. But, uh, but it's like, I need that sort of trajectory. It's a, it's a bit of a problem as a writer because I think I feel I'm too, too logical and too, like, you know, bound by it. But it also definitely helped me structure because I felt like, you know, I, once I had a plan, I could flesh it out. And it was, you know, it was, and that sort of computer science training of like breaking down your problem into elements actually did play a certain part. So those years of computer science were not completely wasted, you know, it, it, it helped. So are you in computer science? Uh, well, I don't know, but it wasn't a very similar situation as yours. I moved from being in software to teaching here. So, it, it all helps. It all helps in the end. That's what we. Well, that's the only thing we can tell ourselves. Because otherwise, what's the alternative? <laughs> yeah. So you went moved back to Kolkata to take care of your mother, and that part really interests me because I have a mother living in Kolkata now, and we chose that as the place for the care. So how do you feel about going back? How was that? I, I should sort of. Uh, First, preface this, uh, pre preface this by saying that I didn't really go back to take care of her. She was being very well taken care of by my sister who, who lives there. Um, and nobody had asked me to go back either or anything. She was, she was fine. She was just unable to travel as much. You know, she, a journey to coming to the U.S. was just too long for her, you know, and she didn't really like to travel. Um, and in fact, I'm quite useless at taking care in the, I mean, my last year, my sister came to the U.S. to visit my niece who was in New York. So I was really left in charge of my mother on my own. And my mother was just in panic, more about the fact that like, oh, baby. she was just like, I hope nothing happens to me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is like a huge vote of con no confidence in, in me. But, um, but you know, it's, a lot of it is much more just psychological. It is, if for her, it's not about that physically I am able to do things, you know, or that you know, medical stuff and all of that. All of that is sort of set up in a, in a system. 
is just having some you around so that you know so she, she can whine at me about like oh you haven't had dinner at home for two days you know just being able to complain about that gives a certain amount of satisfaction <laughs> and it is a it's a and it's nice to know that you know my mother used to always say that whenever you came to visit um i would look forward to it very much but as soon as the day you landed it was like a countdown mm -hmm. right it was going to be about leaving mm -hmm. and it was a real luxury for both of us to not worry about that you know i never said i am back for good i always say i'm back for now we'll see how it goes i because of my life and the way it structures i actually have the luxury to be able to do this which not very many people have many people can't afford to just go away to india or wherever you know leaving a life kids college in the area right and i have it and i was able to do it i was able to work and write so i treat it as an immense gift and it's great to have that luxury of time and being able to spend together though she did say once that uh, you know when i heard initially i said i was going for a year and she said uh, that's great and but she didn't say very much more and then later she said you know i thought i'd gotten used to you coming and going you'd be here for two weeks three weeks whatever you coming and going but then i wondered after like 20 after i spent 20 years here right uh, after 20 years if you came back for a year and then you went back i don't know how i would deal with that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know ashok rokavi says that um in india it's the gay children who look after their parents no my but sister is very good to to it i'm not saying it's your sister i'm talking about your sister but the sense that you know they are the ones who don't leave home or come back home to look after their their yeah, parents yeah but he has the shock has done for he has mother. done you know lots of people you know have done a uh, party because they 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 don't form their own you know you have to form your own family all changing so now it's yeah it's all going to change now because now you know uh, many of my gay friends here or all you know they all have twins <laughs> and the twins and so they are part of the same pressures of raising families here as the heterosexual children yes. were and so suddenly you know that see, choice yeah. about like who gets to who is going to be available yeah. to take care of a parent it it becomes so you know sometimes progress works in strange ways and comes back to bite us in ways we don't expect um but it is true i have known many uh families where a uh, gay son or daughter just by virtue of not having married or something has become a default caregiver yeah. of a parent and and that's the thing like that i always find interesting which we don't talk about because even now in india because perhaps of western influence and stuff this whole lgbt movement also has become in hugely focused on that moment of coming out it's all about coming out which does not you know and so you, like you have television programs on ndtv and said after the break right after the break when we she will come out is basically was like stay tuned uh, she will come out to a pen and what we don't count for the fact is that you know gay and lesbian people have had ways of surviving coping and doing all of these things without necessarily always having to come out in the sort of binary way we think about in the way you are either out or you are not out and there are many many other ways of yeah. being out in the family and a friend of mine would always say that his parents never acknowledged his long term relationship as oh this is my son's boyfriend but every time he had dinner at at home his mother would pack food in a tiffin carrier for the partner who if the partner had not come for dinner and so there were these small ways in which even without naming things you can acknowledge relationships and i think sometimes we don't give enough credit to to these different ways that people do it the last question could you talk about how radio affected your your the, the tuning of your ear for storytelling mm -hmm. radio affected everything i do hugely enormously and i i'm like i am i truly feel i had no business going into radio 
and I truly feel lucky that I had a chance to do it because it affected it affected how I write immensely. Because our radio, you know, you had three minutes or something to tell a story. You had to introduce your characters. You had to set a scene. You had to tell us. So you really learned to make every word count. And you was speaking. You were saying it out. So. Uh, loud. So if you were repeating things, if you were repeating words, it immediately jarred, you know, like you used, even using about twice in, in a set. So you learned to be much more streamlined and economical about writing. And to this day, a lot of what I write, I actually read aloud. Because I, I sort of have to hear it in a sort of radio voice, not necessarily the NPR voice, but just the radio <laughs> voice. Um, to, <laughs> Make sure it's because it's it's like hard to explain, but it has to sound right mm -hmm. rather than read right, and then then I feel a little more okay about it. So thank you so much for thank sharing you. so many thoughts with us. Um, there are there are copies of his book outside, and there is a little reception. So I hope that you will stay and talk and. Eat a little and drink a little. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Thank you.